Hey, Mount Olive, good morning. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hope that you're all having a great day so far. We pray God's blessings upon you today, uh, this Friday, now and always. We continue uh, to make our way through our Lenten series and our Lenten devotions as we uh, continue to journey and follow Jesus uh, throughout the season of Lent and as we ultimately follow him to the cross and as we get ready to celebrate his glorious resurrection on Easter. So we're very excited, very thankful uh, to be with you during this season. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, we are going to continue in our Lenten series and our Lenten devotions. So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to towards the end of John chapter four. So we're going to be in the gospel of John this morning, and we're going to take a look at how Jesus uses signs and wonders and also we're going to look at a little bit of his heart during and when we think about how he looks at signs and wonders because we see signs and wonders in a gr- in a good way right we want to see these these grand displays of power these grand displays of Jesus's authority and his majesty and his miracle working but Jesus when you look at signs and wonders and when you think about how he looks at them He's kind of dismissive about it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we get to that point, we're just going to go ahead and jump into the text. So if you have a Bible with you, we are going to start in the Gospel of John in chapter 4. And we are going to start at verse 46. So the text that we're looking at today is Jesus healing a Roman official's son. So this Roman official comes to Jesus and his son is not doing so well. So let's just go ahead and jump into the text. We are starting at verse 46 in the Gospel of John in chapter 4. So he, Jesus, came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made water, the where he had made the water into wine. So again, John is taking us back to Jesus's very first miracle where he transforms the water into wine, which we talked about earlier this week. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him (coughs) and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Really quick here, a really quick note. Getting sick in the times of the Bible was not like it is for you and I today, right? So maybe we get sick, right? Maybe you've, you've been through that experience of, Maybe a family member, maybe a a spouse, maybe a child, maybe a parent gets really, really sick and it drives them to the point of death. Maybe, you know, it's cold and flu season here in north central Wisconsin. Maybe it's a, oh man, you feel yourself getting sick and you know that you're going to have to take a couple days off to rest and recover, but you know that this illness or this sickness is just temporary and you know you're going to bounce back. That mentality did not exist in the Bible. If you got sick, barring a miracle, it was most likely a slow death sentence because they didn't have the advancements in medicine. They didn't have the Dayquil and the NyQuil. They didn't have the they didn't have the cold and flu medicine that we have today. So if you got sick in this time, barring a miracle, you realistically did not get better. If you got sick, it was more of a, okay, barring a miracle here, this is a, this is a slow process until you die. So you see this official and you see his son, his son is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And so he hears about this Jesus guy who's in town. Word is probably spread about his first miracle in this region. And so this official says, you know what? I'm not even going to waste time. I myself am going to go to Jesus directly and intercede and plead with him on behalf of my son. Now, this guy most likely had servants, which the text will confirm in just a few verses. But you see his urgency. He's going to go plead on his son's behalf to Jesus directly. So we're going to take it. We're going to jump back in at verse 48. Verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So Jesus is jumping into faith right away. You can see that this official is pleading for his son to get better 
And Jesus says, this isn't about getting better or being healed from sickness. This is about faith. This is a faith issue. Verse 49. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, go, because your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour which he began to get better. And they said to him, you know, yesterday at the seventh hour, which is realistically, it's about one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. So let's just take a look at those verses really quick, right? The man believed the word that Jesus had said. And the word that Jesus said to the official is, go, your son will live. Your son will get better. He didn't have a miracle or a sign or Jesus didn't put on this grand display of power. Jesus simply spoke the word, your son is going to be healed. Your son will get better. And that for this official is enough for him to say, okay, if Jesus said so, I'm going to believe him. I'm going to trust him and I'm going to make my way back home. So this Roman, this official is with Jesus and then the official makes his way back home. And at some point on this official's journey, his servants are coming from home. So they meet him realistically at about the halfway point and they say, Hey buddy, your son is getting better. It defies all logic. It defies all explanation, but your son is getting better. The fever has left him. And so the official asks like, okay, when did this happen? What time did this take place? And they said, realistically about one o'clock in the afternoon, or as the text says at about the seventh hour, because in the biblical times, the first hour was typically like 6 AM. It's when the sun, it's when the sunrise happens. Relatively speaking, it's about 6 AM. The father knew, and this is verse 53, the father knew that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. <clears throat> I think it's important for us to look at this text because I think a lot of us, either we ourselves have been at this point or we know somebody who has kind of put Jesus on the spot. And what I mean by that is, we say, yeah, like we'll believe in Jesus, but Jesus has to prove himself to us first. And not only does he have to prove himself to us, but he has to do it in a really grand way. He has to do it in a grand display of his power. He's got to give us a sign or he's got to give us a big wonder that will captivate all our senses and it will defy all our reasoning. Then we'll believe in Jesus. Then we'll give our, then we'll, we'll surrender ourselves to Jesus. Then we'll accept his word, but not this official, right? The official is looking for this grand display of power. He's looking for his son to be healed, but Jesus just speaks the words. Your son will live. Your son will get better. That's what the Rome, that's what this official hangs onto. It's his word. It's not this display of power, right? Jesus doesn't go with him and then perform this giant miracle or this giant display of power. He just says, go, get out of here. Your son will live. Your son will get better. And I think for a lot of us, right, we can't put God in the box and say, this is how God is going to intervene in my life. This is how God is going to reveal himself. We're not God. We don't have control over God. If anything, it's the opposite. God is is the ultimate ruler. He's the ultimate source of sovereignty, power, and authority in all of our lives and over creation itself. But when we look at how God intervenes and how he gets involved and how he makes himself known in our lives, it's through his word. It's through scripture. It's through the Bible. That's how God intervenes in our lives. He sends his Holy Spirit, right, to be in this world and to create and sustain faith. He might do it in a grand way. Maybe God reveals himself to the guy on the fence or the, the woman who's maybe curious in a really grand way. But if we want to know where God is, we have to go in his word. We have to go where he has promised to be. And that's in church. That's in his word and sacraments. That's also here. 
his word, the Bible. That's where God does his work. That's where God's, that's where the Holy Spirit creates, sustains, and strengthens us in our faith and relationship with our Savior Jesus. So as we continue to journey throughout the season of Lent, we have to be very careful not to look for these huge grand displays or these grand miracles or signs or wonders. We just have to look in the word. We have to be in the word. We have to let the word continue to do in us what Jesus has already began and what the Holy Spirit is continuing to do as we continue to follow him during the season of Lent, as we know that the ultimate sign, the ultimate wonder of our faith is the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. And that's what we're looking forward to celebrating on Easter. And that's the confidence that we have that we celebrate it. But in the meantime, and even after that, we want to be strengthened. We go to the word. We go to the word that Jesus says, you know what? You are my child. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are his. You belong to Jesus. <clears throat> Church, that's all that we've got for you uh, this this Friday. We just pray God's blessings upon you today. We want to invite you back for worship, and we want to continue to grow in our faith and relationship with our Savior Jesus. So please join us for worship this weekend. We're going to continue in our sermon series, The Miracles of Paul, and we just pray God's blessings upon you today and this weekend. And in all that we say and do, may it bring glory, honor, and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. So have a great rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend. And we're excited to see you in worship this Sunday. So y'all take care and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.